Whenever I listen to discussions about what the most influential games ever made are, I always hear the same answers. Super Mario 64 for revolutionizing 3D gaming, GoldenEye 007 for popularizing the home console first person shooter, Breath of the Wild for being freaking Breath of the Wild, a literal breath of fresh air for both open world games and the Zelda series in general. You get the idea, and these are all undeniably important pieces of gaming history, but there's one game that doesn't seem to come up as often as it should. Which is why today, we're going to talk about Wii Sports. Earthbound, aka Mother 2, is a landmark title in gaming. Earthbound isn't simply a great game, it isn't just one of the best video game sequels of all time. This is a game that has left such a huge impact that it can still be felt to this day. It perfectly captures exactly what people love about the Mother series. While Mother 1 is a product of its time, Earthbound is the exact opposite. It is timeless. I love this game, I love the history behind its development and localization, I love its style, its gameplay, its charm, the fact that people are still discovering new things about it to this day, I love the community it spawned and the talent it continues to inspire. Earthbound is one of my favorite games of all time and is one of those games that everyone should give a chance. That is my super abridged non-spoiler review of Earthbound. This game is at its best when you go into it with as few spoilers as possible. But honestly, this game is so tightly packed with great moments and oddities that you're bound to find something you've never seen before, regardless of how deep you think your knowledge of the game is. So I'll stop wasting time. Let's start to the Earthbound retrospective. It's funny to think that a game as well known as Earthbound is now is the source of one of the most troubled developments, disastrous overseas releases, and terrible marketing campaigns of all time. Let's start from the beginning. The sequel to Mother 1 entered production almost immediately after that game was released in Japan. It was a no-brainer considering how successful Mother was over there, and Nintendo was wrapping up work on their next generation console, the Super Famicom. A lot of the issues present in Mother 1 were caused by the limitations brought on by the underpowered powered hardware of the Famicom disk system. Shigesato Itoi saw and took the opportunity to improve the ideas from the first game with the help of the added horsepower of the new console. So despite being a Famicom title for a brief period, Mother 2's development soon transitioned to the Super Famicom, once again with Ape Inc. serving as the game's developer. However, the added capabilities of the new hardware didn't translate to a smooth development, far from it. Throughout the game's production, the team ran into hurdle after hurdle, from having difficulties integrating the extended extensive anti-piracy checks that Itoi insisted be included, to running into problems with designing the game's graphics, which weren't completely finished until the very end. Not helping things was how the game's scale and ambition only continued to grow as Itoi came up with new ideas he wanted to include, which forced the team to switch cartridge sizes on more than one occasion to take advantage of more memory. Years passed and the game still wasn't done yet. Things got really bad, Mother 2 was officially in development hell, it got to the point where there were threats of cancellation. If progress wasn't made quickly, the game would need to be scrapped, much to Itoi's dismay. But then, when all hope seemed lost, Itoi met the man whose leadership saved Mother 2, Satoru Iwata. At the time, Iwata was CEO of HAL Laboratory, the studio behind the Kirby games, and he generously offered to lend Itoi's team a hand on the programming side of Earthbound's production. With the combined efforts of Ape Inc. and HAL in conjunction with Iwata's ingenuity and sick programming skills, Mother 2's development wrapped up in just six more months and at long last released in Japan in 1994 to near universal praise. And because of just how much better this sequel was, the Mother franchise was given yet another chance chance to make a splash in the western world. The localization wasn't going to be easy though. Mother 2 has way more dialogue than the first game, and translating it in a way that wouldn't betray Itoi's original intent and tone was not a task that was to be taken lightly. And it wasn't just the script that needed to be changed. Certain graphics were modified as well, either to avoid controversy like with the removal of the red cross on the hospital signs, or because keeping certain sprites as they were in the Japanese release wouldn't make sense to an American audience. Remember Clyde 
Eagle-Eyed Mandolin, the guy I brought up last time that translated Mother 1 plus 2 and Mother 3 in English, he released a whole ass book chronicling the differences between the two versions of Mother 2, just to give you an idea of how many changes were made. The hard work put into the localization was well worth it though, as it's now seen as one of the best translations ever. Serious kudos to Dan Ostin and Marcus Lindblom, who both played their parts in making Earthbound, the final name given to this version of the game, the endearing classic it's known as today. Too bad their efforts were essentially for nothing back in 1995. Earthbound couldn't catch a break, man. It's a miracle that the game was even finished, let alone localized, and nobody f***ing played it. Why would anyone want to play it when Nintendo Power magazines themselves said that the game was shit? Ah yes, the infamous This Game Stinks slogan that was used to advertise Earthbound in the States. What better way to sell your game than by telling people to smell death? Yes, gross out humor was all the rage in the 90s. Hell, I remember it still being pretty big when I was a kid in the early 2000s. But was this really the best way to advertise an IP that was essentially brand new? And since this was in the middle of the Great Bit Wars, when many gamers judged the game's quality based solely on its visuals, the fact that Earthbound's graphics looked underwhelming compared to other games on a Super Nintendo or Genesis, it was doomed to fail. As if the odds weren't already stacked against it, it retailed for 90 bucks. Want my arm as well while you're at it? Earthbound was packed in this behemoth of a box because of the player's guide that came bundled with the game. Combine the inclusion of the player's guide with the development cost and what Nintendo of America spent on marketing, Earthbound performed terribly here. So while Mother 2 enjoyed a fruitful legacy in Japan since the day of its release, going on to be included in the Mother 1 plus 2 compilation game I talked about in the last video, Earthbound fell into the realm of obscurity for several years. It wasn't until the growing popularity of the internet, specifically fan forums and sites such as Starman.net and Earthbound Central, and the general interest that came from the franchise being represented in every Smash game, that some people began began to get curious and sought ways to try out Earthbound for themselves. But you know how it goes. Niche game that didn't sell very well at first suddenly starts to garner attention? Bring in the scum of the earth. For many years, the only way to officially play Earthbound was by playing it on the original hardware with the original cartridge. Prices of copies of the game on eBay were ludicrously high. To this day, a physical copy of Earthbound is one of the most expensive sought-after retro collectibles you can buy. There have been nights where I've come close to clicking that buy now button, but I don't think I'd be able to forgive myself if I did. At E3 2004, Satoru Iwata announced the Nintendo Revolution, the Nintendo Wii's codename, along with their plans to launch an online store for the console where one could purchase original software made specifically for the revolution, as well as retro titles from Nintendo's past home consoles. Among the games that were mentioned, Iwata specifically name-dropped Earthbound during the conference. And this is where I put Earthbound on Wii Virtual Console. If I had one! So this service ended up being the Virtual Console, may it rest in peace. And Earthbound never saw the light of day on the Wii. So, what does one do when it's hard to buy a physical copy of a game without selling a kidney and it's not available in any other form? I'm sorry, God. Earthbound has got to be one of the most emulated video games. Since there was no other feasible way to play the game, f*** it. We broke the law. Like I said last time, emulation is how I first tried the game out, and it's in large part due to emulation that Earthbound gained the cult following it did. Soon enough, there was now a whole group of Earthbound fans who made it their mission to spread the gospel of how great the game really was. And these same fans clamored for the game to be officially re-released in some capacity. To be fair, I don't think Nintendo was refusing to re-release Earthbound on purpose. They have other ways of showing how much they hate us. The sad fact is that Earthbound's a victim to all kinds of legal bullshit mainly in reference to its music. You know how I said in the Mother 1 video that the Johnny B. Good intro is used in one of Earthbound's battle themes? Well, this isn't the only song that the game takes cues from, and because of that, it causes copyright problems for Nintendo of America when they try to re-release the game. Eventually though, these legal troubles must have been sorted out, because on April 17th, 2013, during a Nintendo Direct, Satoru Iwata announced that Earthbound was coming to the Wii U Virtual Console at a later date. And what do you know? It wasn't a lie this time. Finally, Earthbound was wiped widely available in an official form at a reasonable price for everybody to purchase. Kinda. Yeah, if the goal was to draw attention to the game and the series, well, there's one other console I could think of that would have been a worse contender to re-release it for, son of a bitch, Nintendo. But wait, it was also included in the SNES Mini. 
a console that was sold in limited quantities. I sometimes defend this company. I know I'm being a sarcastic prick right now, but even though the circumstances surrounding these Earthbound re-releases were less than ideal, the game did get a lot more popular. The install basis of these consoles may not have been huge, but Earthbound was gaining more notoriety. I was seeing more Earthbound discussion online than ever before from 2013 onward. And nowadays, I think it's impossible to talk about Earthbound without also talking about one of the biggest sensations of the last decade. Toby Fox, a man who started off by making ROM hacks for Earthbound, was about to take the industry and the internet as a whole by storm. In 2015, Toby Fox released Undertale, a game that immediately captured the hearts of indie fans, RPG fans, music fans, and yes, Earthbound fans. These are two very different games, don't mince my words here, but the inspiration is clear as day, even without knowing Mr. Fox's background. Undertale may not have been the first game to be inspired by Earthbound, far from it, but it was the first to really hit the mainstream to this extent. And with all the comparisons that were made between it and Earthbound when it came out, this hidden gem wasn't exactly hidden anymore. Calling Earthbound a cult hit at this point was a severe underestimation of how famous it had become. Come. Even those who were still completely oblivious to the game's existence had more than likely seen bits of its DNA in other works. The quirky, Earthbound-inspired RPG became a subgenre in and of itself. Itoi, Iwata, everyone who worked on the game, I'm sure they knew what they created was a one-of-a-kind experience, but I don't think any of them could have predicted how far this charming game would end up going. So how did I find out about Earthbound? Well, as I mentioned in the last video, Earthbound was technically the first game in the series I played after I became interested from playing Smash Brothers and from watching Chugga Conroy's Let's Play. I definitely wasn't in the right mindset to appreciate the game yet though. I hit a roadblock not that far into the adventure and quickly gave up and moved on to play other games. Quite some time passed before I picked it up again and fully committed myself to beating it. My first impressions were largely positive, though honestly, I think I was a bit spoiled by Mother 3, the game that marked my true return to the series. Mother 3, to me, was nearly perfect, and Earthbound seemed worse by comparison simply because it wasn't Mother 3. Their structures and approaches to storytelling are very different, and I simply preferred Mother 3's overall direction. Fast forward a bit, I bought a Wii U because I make poor life choices and I purchased Earthbound from the eShop. I was still pretty young, but the time that had passed since my first playthrough was enough for me to truly fall in love with the game this time, which took me down a path in life where I made another questionable decision. Earthbound is an unusual case where no matter how many times I replay it, the impression it has on me is different every time. It's a work of art that can be meaningful in different ways to different people at different points in their lives, which is why I described it as timeless earlier. You'd think that a game that sticks to the contemporary setting and time period seen in its predecessor would become more and more dated as time passes, but Earthbound doesn't fall into this trap, and to the best of my ability, I'm going to try to explain why I cherish it so much. Let's start this review off with the biggest reason why Young Me didn't like this game nearly as much as Mother 3, the story. You all know by now how little I care for the way that Mother 1 handled its story. There was pretty much zero character development, the plot was so underdeveloped, and the villain had next to no real presence. Right off the bat, Earthbound looks like it will repeat many of the first game's mistakes thanks to the striking similarities between their setups and main casts. While the story does technically take place after the first game, Earthbound feels much more more like a reimagining or soft reboot than a normal sequel, even though Gygus returns as the villain. But with some added exposition and flavor text and a structure that flows much more naturally than last time, Earthbound avoids the pitfalls that Mother 1 fell into and manages to tell a story that, while still incredibly simple on the surface, gives you a reason to give a shit and has multiple layers of meaning to uncover the more you dig. The year is 1990X in a small town in Eagle Land, the canonical name for the country that represents the United States in the world of Mother. Our protagonist, Ness, is a young boy who suddenly gets woken up by a meteor crash one night. After snooping around the impact site for a bit, he returns home but is once again woken up, this time by an annoying knock on the door. It turns out to be his neighbor and friend, Pokey, who asks for Ness's help to look for Pokey's younger brother, Picky, after the two got separated while
while investigating the meteor. Picky is found right next to where the meteor landed, when suddenly a beam of light interrupts the kids, and from it emerges a talking bee named Buzzbuzz. Buzzbuzz Buzz tells Ness that he is from the future, specifically a future that has been destroyed by the Universal Cosmic Destroyer Gygus. At some point between this game and Mother 1, Gygus became the embodiment of evil, and his psychic power grew to be so immense that he was able to take over the world. Buzzbuzz Buzz tells Ness of a prophecy that states that three boys and a girl will defeat Gygus and save the world from its doomed fate. To do this, Ness must find his eight Your Sanctuary locations and collect the melodies that play there to become strong enough to defeat Gygus. Holy sh**, a clear-cut objective? I forgot what those were like. Buzz Buzz, you're alright. What you say, mm, that you only meant well. With his goal in mind, Ness embarks on an adventure to seek out the Eight Sanctuaries, and along the way he meets and befriends the other heroes mentioned in the prophecy, including the psychic girl from Tucson Paula, the aspiring young scientist from Winters with Daddy Issues Jeff, and the young Prince of the Lom whose parents clearly hated when they named him, Pooh. Slowly but surely, Ness and company find each of the Eight Sanctuary locations, all while helping the various people they meet around the world and freeing towns from Gygus' influence, either by destroying an ominous statue that creates hallucinations, or tricking a bunch of zombies to go into a tent littered with zombie paper. It's like flypaper, but for zombies. There's still more of the story to talk about, but I'd like to save that for later. In the meantime, it may seem that Earthbound's story is… still not very good. Yeah, it's more clear what the objective is and we're introduced to the villain from the very beginning this time. Like literally, the first thing that catches your eye when you boot up the game is this screen that shows the conflict front and center. But it's still a story that feels like it's a part of the background. Again, it doesn't develop much until after you've reached the last sanctuary. Kind of like in Mother 1, where the story suddenly picks up after getting the final melody. But see, that isn't entirely correct. While not everything you do pushes the story forward a considerable amount like you'd expect in a regular story-driven game, Earthbound is more concerned with taking things slow and focusing on smaller developments. It's been said many times already and I'll repeat it again here. Earthbound is a game all about the moments. It's not story-driven in the traditional sense where there's a bunch of twists and turns to keep you hooked like other RPGs. It does get you hooked, but on a more intimate and and personal level. This is a case where the game's contemporary setting greatly benefits the intent. Right away you feel that more personal connection because these settings are instantly recognizable. The NPCs are wackier and snarkier than ever before, and even though many of them can be selfish douchebags, you can't help but grow a soft spot for these people. The excellent writing helps in that regard. Things are not okay in this world. Every place you visit is facing some sort of problem, all caused by Gygus. While you don't see Gygus, I guess until the very end, his presence can be felt everywhere. He is the reason why you get randomly attacked by animals and ordinary citizens. The happy happy cult kidnapping Paula, the zombies in Threed, the existence of Moonside, the police brutality, it can all be traced back to Gygus. Maybe except for that last thing. I think they just wanted to beat up a kid for the hell of it. So as you travel across Eagle Land and the other countries you visit and liberate these places from the clutches of Gygus, it really feels like you're accomplishing something, that your actions are making a difference. You can revisit towns and see how they've changed and recovered since the last time you were there. It may not contribute much to the main plot at a first glance, but everything you do feels significant and it keeps you invested. The side characters you meet also help make this journey an unforgettable one. Like the Runaway Five, this lovable jazz group that gets themselves into debt not once, but twice during your travels. And you have to bail them out both times, in the only way a kid would know how, treasure hunting. But the band frequently returns the favor, letting the party hitch a ride on their bus every now and again and even lending a hand during a battle in Foresight, where all they do is flip a switch to deactivate the enemy robot you're fighting. There's the adorable residents of Saturn Valley, the Mr. Saturn. They're funny. What else is there to say? Their design screams, look at me, I'm the series mascot. They speak very primitive, broken English, tying into how they're meant to represent childlike innocence. The Japanese text font used for their dialogue was even based off of Itoi's own daughter's handwriting. I don't think they're completely innocent, though. They give you this coffee to drink that's... This is drugs. The Apple and Orange Kids are child inventors who aid you on your journey with useful inventions. Well, Apple Kid's inventions are useful. Orange Kid never makes anything that's worthwhile to you. So he's just left alone with his ego and a mission to unboil an egg. Apple Kid, on the other hand, is underestimated because of his 
bad hygiene, though he is the true genius of the two. Then there's the characters who have existing relationships with the main cast. Ness's family is incredibly supportive. His sister runs the Escargo Express, giving Ness and his friends a way to store items they don't need. His dad, like most dads who have sons that wear red baseball caps, is a phone, who can save your progress, deposit money into your bank account, and remind you to take breaks and go outside, loser. And his mom is awesome. She's got this sarcastic, cool mom personality going on, going as far as covering for him when his teacher calls. But from the phone calls you have with her, it's clear that she cares about and is proud of her son. Paula's family is similarly supportive and comical. I like how her dad is super protective of her at first when she starts hanging out with some random boy, and makes it clear to Ness that he can't sleep in his daughter's room. Though he eventually warms up to Ness, and I think it's sweet. Pooh's family is probably the least interesting of this batch of side characters, though there is this great moment when you first take control of him and he has to do his spiritual training, I don't have much to say about Pooh, I'll go into more detail later. And then there's Jeff's relationship with his roommate Tony and his father, Dr. Andonuts. Dr. Andonuts seems to care more about his career as a scientist than maintaining a healthy bond with his son. Jeff is very aware of this, even correcting himself when he refers to his dad as father rather than Dr. Andonuts. I like that this game highlights an estranged family relationship like this. It can be meaningful to those out there with a not so great bond with a family member to have a character like Jeff that they can relate to. And Tony is probably one of my favorite minor characters in any video game. He doesn't have much screen time, but he's clearly a close friend of Jeff's. But that's only part of why I like this character so much. Itoi has confirmed in an interview that he included a gay character in Earthbound, and that character is Tony. As Itoi says in the interview, in a normal real life society, there are gay children, and I have many gay friends as well. So I thought it would be nice to add one in the game too. One thing that I love about this series is its inclusivity. The real world is very diverse, and I appreciate that Itoi didn't shy away from making these games truly representative of real life. Why shouldn't he include a character like Tony? Why shouldn't he include characters like Duster or Kumatora or the Magipsies in Mother 3? I didn't even pick up on Tony's feelings for Jeff until I was much older, which makes me love this confirmation even more because it's so natural. It's a normal depiction of a young boy with a crush. It's wholesome. Earthbound has such a vast assortment of characters cut from different cloths that you're bound to find at least one that you can feel a sort of closeness to. The diversity in the persons you meet makes this world feel lived in, like you are actually the one going around doing good deeds, meeting and interacting with all of these individuals, and marveling at the scale of the locations you explore. Eagle Land is much more open and detailed than it ever was in the first game. No doubt it is one of the best improvements in a sequel that already improves on everything. Sometimes I just like taking a break from progressing the story and spend some time taking a stroll through the city streets, or taking in the beauty of the snowy fields, or sweating my ass off in the desert with the mysterious radio sound effects playing in the background. Onet is an excellent starting town. It's not very big, but there's so many points of interest from the shops, fast food joints, the arcade that has machines loaded with classic titles like Donkey Kong and Space Invaders, the food you can find by searching in trash cans, and the library where you can obtain a detailed map that truly puts into perspective how big some of these areas are. The next town, Tucson, has a much bigger department store than the one in your hometown, a shop where you can rent the most useless transportation item in all of gaming, the bicycle, that can only be use when you have one person in the party, and there's the neighboring Happy Happy Village that's run by a cult when you first arrive that... Yeah, I get why this game has trouble coming out here. The only thing that sucks about taking down the Happy Happy Cult is that this blue cow loses its color and that brings me great pain. Threed isn't very large, but it's one of the most interesting towns in the game to me. Not just because of the spookiness with the ghosts you can fight in the cemetery and zombies you eventually have to capture, though that is an automatic plus because Halloween is the best holiday and you can't change my mind. Not just because you follow a hooker into a hotel room where Ness and Paula get ambushed and captured and god knows what else if this game had a higher age rating, no. The most memorable thing about 3 now to me is this tent. It is home to one of the most fun and interesting glitches I've ever seen. If you repeatedly check this corner, eventually the game's code will straight up break and all kinds of weird sh** 
can happen. People have been able to access the debug menu, warp to different locations, uncover unused text, and even crash the game. Disclaimer, don't attempt this on an original cartridge. It can mess up your save data, so it's best to create a save state before attempting the glitch yourself. Saturn Valley is always a treat to walk through, winters I'll always adore for the music and snowy aesthetic alone. The Lom, being a town in the sky, is just freaking cool, and you can see some screenshot-worthy vistas from up here. But my favorite area by far is Foreside. It isn't actually that much bigger than some of the other towns, but the unique camera angle and diagonal roads makes this city seem larger than anything you've seen up to this point. The skyscrapers are huge, it can be disorienting, but in a good way. Not as disorienting as Moonside though, a twisted, illusory version of Foreside created by the Mani Mani statue. Moonside is a city where no means yes, and yes means no. Everything in this place is surreal, from the sentient paintings you fight to the bright colors outlining the buildings. And the music that plays in the cafe is a garbled and creepy rendition of the American national anthem. What makes Earthbound's locales especially amazing though is the people that reside in them. I mentioned this briefly, but it deserves to be talked about in greater detail. Earthbound has some of the funniest, most interesting NPC dialogue that I've ever had the pleasure of reading. This is one of the many things that factors into this game's insane level of replayability. Every time I play this game, I notice a background character that I don't remember ever talking to and when I do, I almost never regret it. What makes people laugh varies from person to person. I'm aware not everyone is going to enjoy Earthbound's writing, its jokes are very much heavily reliant on being absurd and zany and to some people, it may get a little old after a while. And that's fine, but seeing as my friends tend to know me as a sarcastic smartass, this type of dialogue speaks to me. I love just how weird the NPCs are. When you first enter Onet, the townsfolk will mostly speak to you in tutorial talk, but they do it in such a hilarious way that I still like talking to them even though I know how the game's mechanics work. Earthbound is so good that it found a way of making tutorials fun to read and sit through. That's how you know you've got a great game on your hands. At times the game's humor can be immature, there's poop and fart jokes and whatnot, but I don't know man, you've gotta appreciate some mindless toilet humor every once in a while. Earthbound is just a funny game in general. Some of these enemy sprites are even more wacky than before. I'm convinced this duck knows what hell looks like. There's these pencil statues that you have to get rid of with a pencil eraser device. But then you run into an eraser statue that you get rid of with an eraser eraser device. There's this mini quest late in the game involving this village inhabited by creatures known as tendas who are incredibly shy and won't talk to you. You have to find a book that cures shyness and give it to them. And it turns out that one of these tendas is strong enough to lift up this massive boulder that was blocking the way to the next sanctuary. And when you fall down the hole, you're so tiny. Your party are literal pixels on the screen. Meanwhile, there's big ass dinosaurs and I can't help but think about Tiny Huge Island from Mario 3. At one point, you'll meet a character known as the Dungeon Man, a literal in-game dungeon designer that is so passionate about his craft that he himself becomes a dungeon and you have to explore his insides. Yeah, Master Belch is already funny for the simple fact that he's a literal pile of puke that you defeat by distracting him with a jar of honey, but what's even funnier is that to enter his lair, you have to wait for three minutes behind this waterfall. I cannot tell you how long I was stuck here on my first playthrough because I didn't believe that you actually need to put the controller down and do nothing for three minutes. If you save up enough money, there's a house in Onet that you can buy, but when you do and go inside, there's a reason why the man who sold it to you was only asking for 7,500 bucks. Hey, if this was California, rent would probably be like two grand a month, so this is a steal. And it's still cheaper than some of the stuff you can buy in Summers, a resort town that can best be described as a tourist trap run by entitled rude douchebags. Earthbound is just jam-packed with a plethora of quirky moments. And the last big one I'd like to talk about is the Photo Man. He's this guy who will periodically fall from the sky and stop you in your tracks to take a picture of Ness and his friends. I do partly agree with those who say that this is more annoying than it is charming, especially when some of the trigger points are so close together. But I feel the payoff in the end justifies it. Honestly, the best way for me to express my adoration for Earthbound's comedy would be to list every instance that personally stood out to me, but I would be here for hours if I did that. So for now, I think it's about damn time that we talk about the gameplay. To start off, I want to bring up one of the best changes from Mother 1 to Earthbound, the removal of 
of random encounters. I said in the last review that I typically don't mind random encounters, but that doesn't mean I prefer them over an alternative encounter system. To get into battles in Earthbound, you have to run into the enemies on the overworld. While many of them will make a beeline towards you as soon as you're in their line of sight, all in all, avoiding encounters if you want to is much easier to do. Some enemies have movement patterns that can be manipulated as they are linked in some way to your own movement. So if you move around the overworld in a certain way, you can make it so that they never even come near you. Earthbound is also a game that will despawn enemies once they go off screen. So if you're walking along and notice some enemy formations that don't look like they'd be fun to face, just off screen them and try again. Since I was just talking about how enjoyable it is to go out of your way to find new NPCs to talk to and how much I like exploring the world, it's nice to know that there's a way of doing that this time without constantly hearing Though, like any RPG, I wouldn't suggest avoiding every battle, you don't want to risk being underleveled. However, I am happy to report that Earthbound is not the grindy slog that its predecessor was. This game is properly balanced for 95% of the adventure, and at no point did I ever feel the need to grind for more than maybe 10 minutes at a time when I first played it. Now, since I've played this game a number of times and I'm a lot more familiar with RPGs, I never have to grind at all. You level up much faster in this game. Those big stat increases come way more often, and the enemies aren't as feral as they used to be. One of the most thoughtful design choices in Earthbound is how enemies that are lower level than you will run away, giving you an opening to attack them from behind and get a first strike, something that's normally difficult to do and enemies can do to you as well. If you're powerful enough to where you'd be able to one-shot the enemy, the game will skip the battle entirely and you'll still gain experience. It's a quality of life feature that is really considerate and helps to minimize grinding. I really wish this became a standard in other RPGs. Now all of this isn't to say that this game doesn't have its share of difficult sections and encounters. By far, one of my least favorite things about Earthbound is its intro, specifically the difficulty in the first few hours. The charm is firing on all cylinders as soon as the game starts, but Ness is a little too frail for my liking in the Onet section. The fight against Frank, the trek through the first dungeon, the battle against the Titanic Ant, and especially the endurance test that is the fight against the Onet police force, all of these happen at the beginning of the game, and it's where I believe newcomers will be tempted to drop it all together because it's so hard. Even when you know what's coming and where to get the best equipment in town, it's still pretty damn brutal. But after this part, things become a lot more manageable. In Tucson, you can buy a teddy bear that enemies will sometimes attack during their turn instead of attacking you, which significantly helps with conserving HP. And it isn't long after that you recruit Paula, who brings hard-hitting PSI spells to aid you in combat even more. Basically, Earthbound gets easier as it goes along. Boss fights, which there are way more of in this game, will always put up more of a fight. And on rare occasions, things can and will get a little hectic. Some enemies don't know when to stop calling for help, and others can inflict deadly status ailments. The stone status from Mother 1 returns in the form of diamondization, which is pretty much the same thing. Though the game even manages to make this funny, because party members who get diamondized look like this outside of battles. The gist of it is that, yeah, Earthbound isn't a walk in the park or anything, and the intro can be pretty intimidating, but all all in all, it is not plagued by the awful spikes in difficulty that ruined Mother 1. Not every enemy hits like a bulldozer anymore, and your party is very adept at handling the opposition. Your party, and Pooh, may look like carbon copies of Ninten, Anna, and Lloyd, but these kids can actually get shit done. Let's start with the chosen one himself, Ness. His signature weapon is a baseball bat, he's good at using it and gets smash attacks often. Ness is also proficient in using PSI, though he focuses more on debuffs and buffs than actually using PSI to deal damage, with two key exceptions. PSI Flash, which has a chance of insta-killing certain enemies and even some bosses, and PSI whatever it is that you input it as your favorite thing when you started a new game, which gets stronger as you level up and does wonders at clearing out groups of enemies in one fell swoop. One thing I've always noticed about Ness is that he tends to miss a lot. He doesn't have the best accuracy in my experience. And no, it's not always because of that one mechanic some of you are probably thinking about. I'm aware of it, and I'm gonna talk about it later. Other than that and how slow he is, Ness is a pretty good party member. Paula, just like Anna, is a glass cannon. Doesn't have much HP or defense, but her offensive PSI is amazing. And there's actually reasons to use certain PSI spells over others this time. Whereas in Mother 1, I pretty much just spammed Freeze Gamma or Beam Gamma in every fight,
fight as soon as I learn them. In Earthbound, PSI Freeze is good for dealing a lot of damage to one target, while PSI Fire can hit a whole row of enemies. PSI Thunder doesn't always land, but is deadly when used on the right opponent, like a machine. I'm not sure if there were elemental weaknesses in the last game. If there were, Earthbound puts a lot more importance on them. You have to take them into consideration to do the most damage possible. And just like Ana, Paula uses frying pans for melee attacks, which is pretty funny. Jeff had the biggest glow up by a mile. He puts Lloyd to shame. He can equip laser guns as permanent weapons now, but can still use the returning bottle rockets, bombs, and even new toys to play with like bazookas for even higher damage output. And it's actually worth carrying these with you this time, not only because the game is a lot easier and you don't have to dedicate most of your inventory to healing items, but look at the inventory. Upgraded to 14 slots now per character and now you can have a maximum of 4 party members at once. Plus, some of these weapons seriously f like the multi-bottle rocket that can one-shot many bosses. As if Jeff wasn't great enough, there's this mechanic where he can repair broken items overnight, with the chance of it happening increasing as his IQ stat goes up. When fixed, these can range from one-use items that can be used in battle to extremely potent weaponry. The best of these you can obtain is the heavy bazooka, and once you have it, it pretty much replaces Jeff's main weapon. It does so much damage and is an infinite use item. And to top it off, Jeff has a special battle skill called Spy that will reveal an enemy's stats and weaknesses, a really handy ability for first time players. It doesn't matter that he doesn't get smash attacks and doesn't use PSI. Jeff is awesome and is probably my favorite party member. And finally, there's Pooh. I don't really like Pooh. Not only do I feel like he's kind of shoehorned into the plot when compared to Paula and Jeff whose introductions felt more natural, but as a party member, he's kind of average. He's like a mix of Ness and Paula, borrowing PSI spells from both of their kits, which is nice now there's a party member who can do both offense and support, but he's not as good at either role as his other PSI using friends. Also, there's a point in the story where he's MIA because he goes to train with his mentor. It's neat that when he comes back he learns PSI Starstorm, a spell exclusive to him, but man, having his 14 inventory slots stripped away from you hurts. And it happens right before going through some of the least interesting dungeons the game has to offer. And PSI Starstorm is really powerful, but it uses up so much PP, and you don't even learn a stronger version of the spell until the endgame. Pooh also has a mirror ability where he can transform into an enemy and use their moves, but I rarely find any uses for it. And it doesn't always succeed, so I sort of just ignore it. Also, he's really picky with food items and equipment, the spoiled brat. Pooh is nice to have, but yeah, he's definitely my least favorite party member. So this is all well and good, you've got a strong, capable party to face Gygus' minions, but none of this is as cool as the rolling HP meter, one of the most creative health systems in any RPG. It's simple to understand, but adds so much depth to the battles. When an enemy attacks you, your HP will roll down at a fixed rate, meaning you won't lose those health points immediately. This turns Earthbound's turn-based combat into something more akin to a real-time battle system. Now you are rewarded for quick thinking and fast menu navigation. It becomes a skill to memorize where everything is located in the menus, how your inventory is laid out, and how fast you can make your move and whether you made the right move in the first place. When you take mortal damage, you now have a chance of healing before losing consciousness, or you can take a risk and try to take out the enemy before your HP reaches zero. This makes combat super engaging, and encourages you to improvise at a moment moment's notice. It's harder to appreciate the rolling HP mechanic in the intro since you don't have that much health to start off with, but once your HP starts nearing the triple digits, the combat gets way better. This also contributes to the game's fairer difficulty since most one-hit kill moves are no longer truly one-hit kill, since now you have a chance to save yourself. Another thing that makes this game more accessible is the improved navigation and structure. Earthbound can still be pretty open-ended at points, and yeah, there are certain parts where I'd argue that it's not very very obvious what you should do next, like with your first run-in with a pencil statue. There's no reason you should know that you have to invest in Apple Kid's work, then go investigate the pencil statue, and then go back to Tucson to trigger a call from Apple Kid telling you that he has invented something that can get rid of pencil-shaped statues. There's other examples like this I can nitpick, but there's nothing as severe here as there was in Mother 1. Plus, it's very hard to miss the sanctuary slash melodies this time, something that I couldn't say about the first game. And I mean, there was a detailed play 
player's guide in the original release for a reason. And there's an in-game hint system in case you really get lost. And in general, there's other improvements like the dungeon design that isn't so labyrinthian anymore, and the visuals that avoid the confusing copy-paste nonsense I complained about last time. I realize I've been shitting a lot on the first game's shortcomings, but I honestly can't stress enough just how much better Earthbound is. It doesn't help how similar the two games are. I can't help but bring it up when noticing all the things that Earthbound does right. Controls that were once unresponsive are now smooth as butter, as they should be. Your movement not coming to a halt when you run into certain walls is a nice touch. There's several other additions that improve the game's quality of life. You can now check what your PSI abilities do in the status screen without having to waste PP just to figure out what each one does. The L button serves as a context sensitive button that you can use to talk to people and check things on the fly, without the extra step of having to bring up the menu. When shopping for equipment, character portraits will flash if the selected piece of equipment will improve your stats. The teleport ability is now impossible to miss and it even gets an upgrade when Pooh joins the party. Where you can teleport is also no longer limited to just towns. You can pretty much go to any major area, so it can really come in handy in case you need to make an emergency stop at a hospital or hotel. Dungeon exploration, on top of not being as confusing as last time, is no longer a painful test of endurance. This is thanks to the inclusion of magic butterflies that restore 20 PP to each party member when you touch them. It can make all the difference if you're running low on health because you can pretty much use a life up spell for free if you find one. If you do have to leave a dungeon for some reason though, the exit mouse item is self-explanatory and simple to use, functioning like an escape rope in Pokemon. Way easier to understand than the breadcrumb trail mechanic from the first game, which I'll admit I completely forgot to bitch about in the last video so I'm making up for it by bitching about it now. Even though you still don't see your party during battle, fights are more visually interesting now with these iconic trippy backgrounds that catch your eye. PSI spells have unique animations and I freaking love this game's sound design. I like just navigating the menus and the sound effects that come with each cursor movement and selection. PSI moves have distinct audio effects and when you land a smash attack, it feels so powerful. Audio is one of Earthbound's strongest aspects in general. This soundtrack tackles so many genres, no song ever feels out of place despite the variety in the OST. It has a great mix of ambient pieces, energetic tunes, soothing melodies, if there's a type of music you're a fan of, Earthbound probably has it. And as I stated, many songs pay homage to well-known music by famous artists, and it's always a delight when you catch one of them. I like the use of synth and electronic sounds used in several of the game's tracks to represent the sci-fi and future characteristic elements the game is filled with. I always look forward to when the Runaway 5 show up because I know my ears will be treated to an amazing jazz piece. Foresight's theme is simply brilliant. It's so catchy and a joy to listen to every time I step foot into the city. A lot of songs from Mother 1 are revived with higher quality audio, and many of them are given full-blown remixes, like the shop theme that's now played with the banjo to create a song that always makes me feel happy. And while I personally prefer the 8 melodies from the first Mother game, Earthbound's version is just as incredible. In terms of my thoughts on the graphics, while yes they aren't as jaw-dropping as what other games on the Super Nintendo were able to accomplish, Earthbound is still very appealing because of how unique its art style is. It's colorful, charming, I really like the crooked fonts used on buildings and billboards, and I like when the environments get all psychedelic. It's just a really pleasant game to look at that still holds up visually.
However, like any game, there are a couple of things in Earthbound that bother me quite a bit. And before I discuss the last main points I want to go over, I might as well talk about my complaints now. Inventory is an easy thing to pick on. Yeah, it's bigger than before, but it's still very easy to run out of space. There still isn't any category for key items, and this game's storage system, the Escargo Express, while it is yet another one of Earthbound's quirky traits that I like, isn't the most convenient thing out there. You have to call your sister to request a delivery or pickup, go outside, and walk around for a bit for an Escargo Express employee to find you. When he does, you can only store or take out three items at a time, and each call will cost you 18 bucks, and money can be pretty hard to come by in this game. There's some weapons later on that will drain your bank account with how expensive they are. I may not have to grind for levels, but every now and then I do grind for money. It isn't too bad, you don't need the best equipment currently available at all times, but it's still worth pointing out. Speaking of equipment, Earthbound has this wonderful mechanic where certain foes hold items that have a 1 in 128 chance of dropping after they're defeated. This gave the community the great idea to create the 1 in 128 challenge, a true 100% run where you try to obtain every single one of these items. This is entirely optional, there's nothing special you get for doing this. It's a challenge mode made by psychopaths for soon to be psychopaths. Trust me, you'll go crazy with how long it can take to get these drops. Normally, I wouldn't care about this, so why am I bringing it up? Well, most of these 1 in 128 items are superfluous and can be obtained via other means, but a select few are so tempting to go after that the completionist in me can't help but go a little f***ing crazy obsessing over them. Each party member has an ultimate weapon, and you guessed it, they're found through these 1 in 128 drops. The only weapon in the entire game that Pooh can equip, the Sword of Kings, happens to be among them. Not once have I ever been able to get get any of these. I spent about 5 hours one time several years ago trying to get the Sword of Kings from the Starman Supers in Stonehenge base to no avail. The cruelest one of all though is Ness's ultimate weapon, the Gutsy Bat, which the player's guide says is dropped by the Krakens that can be found in the late game area the Sea of Eden. This is… what's the word? Oh right, a f***ing lie. These Krakens don't have the Gutsy Bat. I'm sure there's at least one kid out there who played along with this guide and spent an eternity trying to find this weapon, and it became their Joker origin story. Moving on to other things that annoy me, party members, with the exception of Pooh, start off at level 1 again, which is still incredibly stupid. But at the very least, the process of getting them up to speed is nowhere near as arduous. I already said how I don't really like the intro or the section where Pooh temporarily leaves the party, but but there's two other areas that come to mind when I think about parts of Earthbound that I'm not very fond of. The first is Deep Darkness. It's not a very interesting area and it's a chore to get through with all the swamp water you have to walk through that slows you down significantly. Ness and the gang already move slower than Nintendo's party in Earthbound Beginnings because of the lack of a run button, and the only ways to move faster are with the bicycle, eating skip sandwiches that increase your walking speed for a brief period, or abusing the teleport exploit I explained in the Mother 1 video which still works here. But Deep Darkness darkness is still nowhere near as horrendous as the monkey caves. This is what I classify as the only truly terrible part of Earthbound. It's basically a trade quest where you have to give monkey specific items they want for them to let you explore more of the caves. You're not gonna know what you need when you first play the game, it's hard to remember even on subsequent playthroughs. You won't know in which order to talk to the monkeys to minimize the number of things you have to bring with you yourself. My frustration with the inventory also hits an all time high here as you can probably imagine. And this is right after your inventory gets smaller because Paula gets kidnapped for the second time. This part flat out sucks, and the main characters once again could have been explored more. I'm mainly referring to Paula and Pooh. Paula at least talks more than Anna, which automatically makes her a better character, but at the end of the day, she's here to serve as a love interest for Ness. That's her main purpose. And Pooh feels more and more like an afterthought the more I think about him. The most interesting thing happens when you're first introduced to him. Honestly, I liked Teddy more. I don't know, if Earthbound only had three party members, not much would be lost if you ask me. The best thing about Pooh is his name. Yes, I know I'm an adult, shut up. Even though the game obviously isn't perfect and won't appeal to absolutely everyone out there, I still consider Earthbound to be a masterpiece. Because the things it does do right, what it sets out to do, is so exceptional to the point where I can overlook the faults and just focus on the unforgettable journey. And where I think Earthbound excels the most is, once again, 
it's timelessness. During my first playthrough, while yes, I was still far too young to appreciate everything it had to offer, for a while, Earthbound became that game that I would spend long summer nights playing. The game's weirdness and distinctive visuals captivated me, and a part of me honestly liked pretending that I was Ness, and it was my friends and I who were fighting all these bizarre monsters and aliens, traveling the world in the Skyrunner, uncovering the truth behind the legend of Stonehenge, and saving the kidnapped residents from possibly being probed. Earthbound was this epic adventure that I felt I was genuinely a part of. When I played it on the Wii U, I took the time to talk to way more of the NPCs and now saw Earthbound as one of the funniest games ever, with a never-ending stream of mysteries and characters that were fun to theorize about. As a kid, Earthbound appealed to the part of me that dreamed of being a badass hero who saved the world from evil. As a young teen, Earthbound appealed to the comedy fan and nerd nerd in me, the part of me that's still obsessed over piecing together the Zelda timeline, liked watching shows all about mysteries like Gravity Falls, and treated everything covered on game theory as irrefutable fact. It was the phone guy? And now, Earthbound appeals to the young adult in me who endlessly worries about the future, suffers from self-esteem issues, anxiety, and an inferiority complex, and just wishes there was a way to turn back time and return to the good old days when I didn't have another care in the world other than playing games I love, like Earthbound. And the character who resonates with me the most? is Ness. He's a mute for pretty much the whole game, but every now and then we get brief glimpses of his thoughts, like when he claims one of the sanctuaries as his own or when he gets homesick and loses concentration during battle, with the only way of curing the homesickness being to call his mom. On my first couple of playthroughs, I didn't really notice that this was the game's way of humanizing Ness, while doubling as another one of Earthbound's special mechanics that's so uniquely Earthbound. When you reach Lumine Hall, Ness takes the time to reflect on the journey and and his thoughts are literally spelled out for us to take in. From this small bit of text, you can infer that Ness has his doubts as to whether he and his friends will be able to succeed. He knows what they're up against and how things will only get more dangerous from here on out. This all culminates in the Magicant sequence. Here, you walk through Ness's mind and explore his psyche. I love the way that they repurpose Magicant for this game, and of course, I love the abstract imagery here. But what stuck out to me the most in this section is this kid. This is Ness's younger self and I'll just let you read what he has to say. Considering its reputation of being weird and lighthearted, Earthbound is surprisingly mature. The flying men that you later meet and contemporarily recruit are a symbol of Ness's courage. And Magicant ends in the perfect way, with Ness using that courage to face his dark side that manifests itself as the Mani Mani statue. Ness's arc from being an ordinary kid from Onet to growing into the brave and capable hero worthy of wielding the power of the sanctuaries is complete. A total contrast to his immature, green greedy, and tragic neighbor. Pokey is an excellent recurring villain that shows up occasionally during your adventure to annoy you and cause trouble. He briefly becomes a member of the Happy Happy Cult. He shows up again later as a political and business partner to Mayor Monotoli along with his dad, acting like a real spoiled shithead with his newfound wealth. And even off screen, he never stops making things difficult for the party. Now, the reason I say that Pokey's story is tragic is because his behavior stems from feelings of jealousy, as is revealed when Ness sees him in Magicant. Pokey is a child who just wanted companionship. Unfortunately, like many kids, he inherited his unlikable traits from his family, specifically his dad, a man who didn't hesitate to abandon his wife and son Picky to get rich in foresight, and whose favorite method of bonding with and raising his children is via physical and verbal abuse. So it's no surprise that Pokey is envious of his next door neighbor Ness, who does have a loving family, and it explains why he shamelessly acts like the two are best buddies at the start of the game. And when he learns that Ness, of all people, has an important destiny awaiting him, that envy morphs into hatred, and Pokey becomes susceptible to Gygus's power, like so many others around Eagle Land. That's why in the end, I sort of feel bad for him. He becomes a monster, and I can't help but think that things could have gone differently.
After the Magicant sequence, Ness and his friends go to Saturn Valley where Dr. Andonuts, Apple Kid, and the Mr. Saturns have completed their work on an invention known as the Phase Distorter, a vehicle that can be used to travel through time and space. Gygus, knowing about his prophesized defeat at the hands of Ness, is actually attacking the present day from 1,000 years in the past. So the party uses the Phase Distorter to travel back in time to stop him once and for all, transferring their souls into robot bodies to prevent the machine from destroying their real bodies, knowing full well that there's a strong Strong possibility that they may not be able to return. Ness, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh locate Gygus in the cave of the past, now joined by his new right-hand man, Pokey, now fully succumbed to pure evil. The fight that follows is one of the most memorable and talked about final bosses in gaming history. At first, Gygus' real form is contained in the Devil's Machine. Pokey fights you as well and you get a clear look at his face. It's obvious that he's a husk of his former self and beyond redemption. The blue color of his skin likely caused by traveling through time in his own body. And the music here is popping the hell off. When you do enough damage to Pokey, he turns off the Devil's Machine and you see the true form of Gygus. He became so powerful and full of rage that he shattered his own mind. And what you see is what remains. A horrifying, nightmarish entity with attacks that are impossible for the party to even make out or predict. Pokey leaves, certain that the heroes stand no chance at defeating Gygus. For a first time player, this battle is absolutely terrifying. Which has led fans to endlessly theorize how exactly Gygus went from this to this, but in the moment, coming up with an explanation doesn't matter. Ness, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh, they're stuck fighting something that they can't even comprehend, likely losing hope and slowly accepting that they're not gonna make it out alive. So as a last resort, they pray. And those prayers are heard in the present day by the people that you have helped throughout your journey. And they all come together to pray for the safety of the four kids. Earthbound uses the cliche power of friendship trope in an incredibly effective way. I adore this entire sequence. This combined act of kindness and warmth are enough for Gygus' power to weaken. His attacks become weaker and his defenses begin to crack. But it's still not quite enough. The people of Eagle Land need help from one other person. The person who has played the biggest role in this quest, the person holding the controller. Gygus is defeated, and the children's souls return to their bodies in the present, welcomed with open arms by the world they just saved. Pooh returns to his kingdom in the law. Jeff stays with Dr. Andonuts, who he now acknowledges as his dad, hinting at the possibility of the two repairing their relationship. And Ness walks Paula back home, in an epilogue where you can go almost anywhere you want and see what new things the people have to say. Even in the game's final moments, the attention to detail is through the roof. When Ness returns home and the credits roll, you get a roll call of the cast and the payoff to the photo man's frequent interruptions, accompanied by the track Smiles and Tears, a song that never fails to make me feel emotional. Earthbound is a masterpiece. It's a fun, comical, eerie, dark, thought-provoking, memorable, heartwarming masterpiece 
that is infinitely replayable and infinitely lovable. This will no doubt be the longest video on the channel at the time of uploading it, and I feel like I barely scratched the surface of this game. I could include another video's worth of rambling about all the lines that made me laugh out loud, the unused content that still hasn't been fully uncovered, how interesting the speedrunning scene for this game is, but none of it would change my main point, which is that Earthbound is more than a video game. Similar to how all the characters come together at the end, Earthbound has brought together so many individuals who each have their own stories and experiences to share about the game. And I think it's wonderful that Itoi has created something that has united people from all across the globe. With all the grief and sadness that we see in our everyday lives now, it's nice to have games like Earthbound to remind us to never stop cherishing the smaller moments and and that when we work together, there's nothing we can't accomplish. That is the mark of a phenomenal game. A game that wouldn't even exist without Satoru Iwata. July 7th of this year marked the 7th anniversary of Mr. Iwata's passing. It feels like it was just yesterday when I was out shopping with my family and I checked my phone to see what stupid arguments people were getting in on Twitter that day, and I remember the feeling of my stomach dropping when I saw the heartbreaking news. To us Nintendo fans, Satoru Iwata wasn't just a corporate executive behind the scenes of the company, he was a friend. You could tell by the way he presented Nintendo Directs that he knew his audience on a personal level. That there was real passion in his words, that he gave a crap about his job and putting smiles on others' faces. He was well liked and respected and for good reason. He not only loved his job, he cared about who he worked with, including, of course, Shigesato Itoi. Few things make me smile quite as much as remembering when Nintendo wasn't doing well financially, Iwata cut his salary in half to guarantee that nobody would lose their job. He had such a kind personality, and it's kind of poetic that that personality can be felt in arguably the most important game he worked on. And through Earthbound, Iwata and anyone else who had any kind of input on how the final product turned out will forever be immortalized. On my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer, but in my heart, I am a gamer. I miss you.